This is BBC One Scotland. Now Campaign 99 with Ian McWhorter. Tonight, the Liberal Democrats appeal to Scotland. Use your second vote to stop Labour's Holyrood juggernaut. Hello and welcome to Campaign 99. And with two days of campaigning left, the tension seems to be shifting to the second vote on Thursday. There are, of course, two votes in the Scottish parliamentary election, one for constituencies and one for party lists to elect the additional members required under PR. Labour seem to dominate the first ballot. The second list votes are soft. At least that's what the party strategists all seem to think. Tonight, the Liberal Democrats used a rally in Edinburgh to appeal to second voters. But aren't the politicians getting a little ahead of themselves and us? The Liberal Democrats spent much of this campaign distancing themselves from the SNP. But now they're worried about Labour getting overall control and not needing the Lib Dems to form a government. At tonight's rally, they called on Scotland to use the second vote to stop Labour in its tracks. There are many parts of Scotland where people have not looked seriously at the Liberal Democrats before because they felt we couldn't win. The message under the new electoral system is that everywhere in Scotland people can vote Liberal Democrat with a realistic expectation of a Liberal Democrat being elected. Almost 300 years ago, we lost our Parliament. Now we're about to get it back. An unmistakable voice appeals for votes in the SNP's final election broadcast tonight. Most SNP seats will come from second votes, but they aren't admitting it. I'm saying to people, vote SNP in the first ballot, the second ballot, and in the council elections and let's have Scotland's party running Scotland's parliament. The opinion polls are suggesting that perhaps Labour's second vote may be weakening slightly. We've had three out of five polls in recent days saying that Labour's second vote may be below 40%, and it's the first time they've been showing this for some considerable time. And all the other parties will be hoping that perhaps this is evidence that that vote might be capable of being prized away, and of course they all want to get it to go into their direction. So, some sophisticated tactical voting is expected on Thursday, but do the voters understand what's expected of them? No, <laughs> I haven't got a clue, to be honest. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm sure my mother will explain it to me if I phone her. No, I don't understand anything. <laughs> With two days campaigning left, there's still a deal of confusion on the streets about how and how often to vote. The old electoral signposts are absent. It's not just a matter of crossing a box anymore. On Thursday, everyone will have two votes. In the first vote, on the lilac ballot paper, you vote for your constituency MSP. He or she will be elected under the usual first-past-the-post system. The second vote is on the peach ballot paper. Each of these will have the party name and the party list of candidates. The votes placed here are used to elect top-up candidates from the party lists to ensure proportionality overall. Some voters have got the hang of it. First Labour and second Green Party. Split it so that it's not predominantly Labour, so there's more like input from the other parties. Yeah, I'll probably vote for some kind of smaller party or something. Just, you know, it's nice to have a kind of balance or someone that's going to, you know, get rid of the tuition fees. The second vote is definitely going to Green, but I don't know who the <laughs> candidate is going to be. Small parties like the Greens hope PR will give them a chance. And even though the odds are against them, they're bidding for the second vote. Give your first vote, if you must, to the Grey parties. But we say give your second vote for the environment. Give it for the future and vote Green. But the Blues want your second vote too. Their Scottish leaders been calling on Labour voters to lend their second vote to the Tories to defend the union. It's very important that we do not end up with Scotland polarised between Labour and the SNP. If that happens, uh, it would be a disaster for Scotland. There must be room for a unionist alternative to Labour that does not take Scotland down the road of separation and isolation. Hello. How are you doing? Of course, it's Labour who have most to lose in this frantic auction for the second vote. It was never intended as an alternative, they say, so don't lend it to anyone else. We've got a very simple message for the voters of Scotland that they can use every vote for Labour. The second vote isn't a second choice, so we're asking people on Thursday to vote Labour, Labour and Labour in the local council elections. 
Well, Labour, I think, certainly must be worried about this. In a sense, they've always been worried about the second vote because one of the things they know is that it's quite likely in quite a few of the regions in Scotland that they will do so well in the constituency contest that they won't be in, entitled to any top-up seats. And Labour have been trying to persuade their supporters that despite this, they need to vote for Labour on both votes. And the other parties are trying to dissuade them from this. And this, in a sense, is now going to be a key part of the battle in the final few days. Labour fears that people might split their votes are likely to be realised as their rivals paint a grim picture of a parliament dominated by one party. However, in this first ever Scottish election, it's not just the politicians who are feeling their way. The voters are on a steep learning curve too, and no one knows yet just how they will use their new franchise. So confusion reigns in the second vote. Now, the latest opinion polls over the weekend all suggested that Labour still has a substantial lead in both first and second votes. But there have been suggestions, confirmed in a Daily Express poll tomorrow, that the gap could be narrowing on that second vote. The poll tomorrow still has Labour ahead on seats, but in the second vote it indicates a drop of Labour support of 8%. The SNP second vote remains static, but the Tories and others are up, and the Liberal Democrats are down 5%. Well, I'm joined now from Edinburgh by Mike Russell of the SNP and here in Glasgow by Labour's Jack McConnell, Charles Ferguson of the Conservatives and Keith Raffin of the Liberal Democrats. Let's start with you, Jack McConnell. It looks like you're losing it on the second ballot. Well, I don't think anybody's losing it yet. The, uh, the vote takes place on Thursday and I think the message that we've got to get across between now and Thursday and I think all the parties should try and get across is that the second vote is probably actually the most important. It is the one that will decide wh which party uh, either has an overall majority or the governing stake at the new parliament. And I think that uh, when voters are voting on the second ballot, they have to vote for the type of government that they want in Scotland, for who they would trust to run Scotland after the elections on Thursday. OK, Keith Raffin, Raffin for the Liberal Democrats. What exactly are you calling for in the second ballot? Well, what's clear to us on the doorstep is simply this that people do not want Labour to have it all their own way. They don't want Holyrood to become Strathclyde Regional Council writ large. They don't trust the SNP, they, want to, they don't want divorce from the rest of the UK, the Tories are irrelevant. And they're coming over to us in large numbers on the first and the second vote because basically they want to see people who make the Parliament work, as we do, to raise the standard of health and education. I mean, just to give you an example, I was at Fife Elderly Forum not long ago in Cardendown. Staunch Labour supporters came up to me and they said very quietly, you won't get our first, but you're getting our second. Right. And they've worked it out. A Labour vote in Mid-Scotland and Fife, second vote, is wasted okay. because Labour's not going to get any top-up seats. Well, Charles Ferguson, for the Tories, you're looking for the second vote too, aren't you? Absolutely. But are you irrelevant? No, we're certainly not as irrelevant as the Liberal Democrats, and we're also... There's only quite a few people well, at the Times. <laughs> I think that when people vote, they'd like to know whether they're voting for separation or not for separation, and if you're a Liberal Democrat, you don't know, because you don't know where they'll go. If I could illustrate this by way of an example, taking the West of Scotland seat, for instance, on the general election results, Labour did so well in the general election that they would take all nine seats. What happens is that one's added to their vote, and their vote's divided by ten, which means that despite having 190,000 votes, they get into the second ballot with 19,000 votes. Right, OK, but, well, uh, well, let's leave there. I'm trying to explain to why the Conservatives are not relevant, yes. because after that, those votes Very are taken quickly, out, please. it's between Conservatives and SNP with three seats each, so you either vote Conservative and keep right. SNP out, or you vote anyone else and get SNP in. Well, OK, then. Uh, keep it, it seems to be that the, the main uh, task, uh, Mike Russell, seems to be to keep you out in the second ballot. Well, I hope the Tories aren't explaining anybody to uh, explaining this to anybody because they'd be lost by now. <laughs> and as usually, the Liberals are saying the wrong things at the wrong time. I mean, just as the polls show that far from there being a Labour juggernaut, the Labour campaign uh, wagon, its wheels are falling off, the Liberals are calling for something else. The reality is that what this is election about is about hope and it's about confidence. And if people have hope and confidence, they should be choosing confidently for the future. Ballot one, ballot two, and ballot three. And that's really what is impressing people. What the SNP is talking about is hope and confidence in the future. All the other but three so far have been using the old words, the old stale you, words, yeah. and they don't work. Would you accept that the SNP surge is largely illusory? There is no surge. You're, you're basically no. stuck. I wouldn't accept that at all. I mean, I've been spending a lot of time out of the office talking to people th and also to our candidates. There's a very strong movement towards <coughs> the SNP and it's coming because all the other parties are talking about negativity and how they can stop things happening. The uh, SNP is the only party that's talking about how things can happen and that's getting public support as the polls are showing. Of course, the truth is, Jack McConnell, isn't it, that Labour doesn't want or expect to be in overall control of this uh, parliament. 
what we want to have as many seats as we possibly can have in the new parliament, and we want to win the voters yeah, but there was, uh, for that support. Donald, you always said they didn't want to have well, overall well, control. We to, well, he didn't, he didn't say that. What he said was that we didn't want any party to unfairly win overall control, and we, well, are, meaning we, the won't, do that, we won't do that under this system. What we, well, any, any outcome is still possible on Thursday, Ian, and I think that's what's important. But don't you this. think it would be bad for the Scottish well, Parliament for Labour to have an absolute majority? I, well, I think it would be bad for the Parliament if the final outcome doesn't reflect the views of the voters. And what's important on Thursday is that the final outcome in the Parliament reflects the views of voters. And what is possible as a result of perhaps some of the clips that we saw earlier, some of the confusion about the system and people perhaps having a second choice rather than a second vote for the party they actually want to be in charge in the Parliament, I think you'll see the potential for the Parliament not to reflect the views of the voters because people use the second vote for their second choice there rather is than a, their first choice. There is a so lot we're asking people to vote for their first choice on the second okay. ballot because they should use the second ballot to choose the way the Parliament steers Scotland's future. Well, Keith Raffin, is the logical course, as Jack McConnell says, to, to vote one, two for the same party? No, it's not. And you heard Professor John Curtis say it, uh, one of Scotland's most distinguished apologists, and um, Professor Bill Miller said the same, that basically a Labour vote on the second vote is wasted. It's certainly so in mid-Scotland 5. None of the polls show Labour getting any top-up seats for what Charles was Absolutely trying, untrue. for what Charles was actually trying, what Charles was trying to explain not terribly well, is basically the number of Labour seats that they Everything. are likely to win on the first on the first vote means that they will not get top up seats and you, people are voting positively for us because they realize we're not sticking to Tory spending limits we want to raise the standard for health and education okay. much further than Jack does. But Charles Ferguson the campaign to educate the Scottish people about the nature of this vote has not been a conspicuous success. I th no the problem is it's not that the Labour or the Tories are being negative it's the separatism is yeah. such a worry to oh, Labour and the Conservatives. Here we go no, again. If you let me finish, I, I think Sad. this is the level of your debate, isn't it, to interrupt the Tories whenever they say something sensible. But moving swiftly on, yet. things have been focused so much on the menace of separatism. Isn't a vote for you effectively a vote for Labour? No, it's not. It's a vote for the union. It's a vote. Well, it's not it's a waste of vote. It's you think Completely every irrelevant. vote that doesn't go to Liberal Democrats is an irrelevant all vote. Of and I can't think of anything the more irrelevant than voting for a party that doesn't know with whom it will sign. All the Alec Buchanan and Smith Tories. Will you form a coalition with them? Or will you side with them? Nobody else. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. Well, I'm afraid we're running to conclusion here. I'll have to ask Mike Russell to come in and answer some of these charges. Well, all I'll say is I'm immensely glad I'm not in your Glasgow studio because in Edinburgh there's a calmness prevailing because what we've got to do is have confidence and hope and you've just seen an example of the old negative politics what people have to do is to vote for the future not for the past that you've just seen. <laughs> okay Mike, Mike Russell, Keith Raven, Charles Ferguson, Jack McConnell thank you very much and now what about the third vote? Well it may come as a surprise to many people when they enter the ballot booth to find that they have to fill in three ballot papers on Thursday. The ballot for Scotland's 32 local authorities has turned into the forgotten election. There are 1,232 seats at stake and 3,851 candidates. Only one thing certain that this turnout in this local election will be higher than the near 40% they usually get. Local government has had a pretty bad image with sleaze and DLO mismanagement and reform is likely to be one of the first acts of the Scottish Parliament. Tim Reid reports. Whilst the Premier League politicians are out on their battle buses, the Cowden Beaths of Scottish politics, local councillors, are out on foot. They are the forgotten ones. They're asking for you to vote for them on the third white ballot paper. Why? It is vital that we do have good uh, local government because although the general public don't appear to uh, be very fond of the councillors, they value the actual services that come out of local government. Scottish local government employs over 200,000 people and there's more than £5.3 billion spent in Scottish local government and it controls everyday services, everything from cleansing to housing to education to social work. So local government does play a very important part in people's everyday lives. Well, you often find that people have more contact with their local councillors than they do with their MPs. If you think that local councils have the responsibility for your roads and your pavements and your schools and your libraries and your swimming pools and um, a whole host of other things, emergency services, the, the actual impact on every p an individual's lives is, is quite considerable. All 32 Scottish councils are up for grabs, including Edinburgh. Their leader Keith Geddes is standing down. Opponents say that Labour put the local elections on the same ballot as the Scottish parliamentary ones so that their slips wouldn't show. Obviously the Labour Party is taking the view that the best way to deliver services in Scotland under the new parliament 
is to have Labour councils working in partnership with the Labour Parliament to effectively deliver services in a way which other parties couldn't. The local government in Scotland is dominated by Labour councils and uh, the Labour councils have done extremely badly. Within them you will find a mixture of um, incompetence, malpractice, cronyism and indeed corruption and in some you will find all four of those. I think that um, Tony Blair has been very keen to try and cover this all up by, so he's tagged it on to the end of the Scottish Parliament um, elections in the hope that people will just quietly forget about it and it will not be a focus. Local and national government in Holyrood could end up in conflict over just who does what and with a general election turnout one and a half times the normal local election ones, the results could be interesting. It's kind of difficult to find the Tory vote on the ground. It, it, it does seem to be vanishing really very quickly. Um, it, it, it's hard, hard to find. Uh, and I think that's happening both locally and, and nationally, that uh, people have lost all confidence in, in the Conservative Party. They don't really know what they stand for any longer. And they're not prepared to support them. All the parties, though, say they've found their voters. I would expect the SNP to gain three or four councils and significantly uh, increase the number of councils we have across the country. We're fighting 1,057 wars, which is more than any other parties ever fought in Scottish history, and we expect to make very significant gains. This is one of the most important votes they've got for the next three years, perhaps four years, for local services. And as far as um, I would be concerned, I would be telling them to um, vote for the Conservative candidate on that. Scottish local government will spend about 43% of the Parliament's total uh, expenditure. And therefore, in terms of service delivery, in terms of over overall expenditure, they are very important indeed. Partnership between Labour at a local level and Labour at a national level is very, very important. And I think education will be the key issue in the local government election. Political hype or reality? Local councils are playing second fiddle now, and that looks likely to continue in the future. Tim Reid with an appeal for the forgotten election. Now, as always, the press has played a key, a controversial role in this election. None of the Scottish newspapers support the SNP, and in desperation of what the Nationalists believe to be unfair treatment, they launch their own alternative newspaper, Scotland's Voice. <laughs> So tonight, the battle bus has taken a diversion down the street of shame to look at tomorrow's ship wrapping. The SNP knows just what Scotland needs, another newspaper. Yeah, about as much as John Prescott needs another chin. Here's plucky Nicola Sturgeon launching it. Actually, this is just the dummy edition. At least we're assuming that's the reason why the inside pages are blank. It's either that, or they had to drop the debut column by winning Ewing, Agony Ant, at the last minute. Don't the Nats get it? We're not a tin-pot, single-party state. We have a free press. Unlike, say, the Soviet Union, where they had two big papers in the government's pocket. One was called Pravda, which means the truth, and Izvestia, the news. And as Muscovites used to point out, there is no truth in the news, and no news in the truth. Here in Scotland, though, we're too clever to fall for clumsy attempts at mind control because we have the daily record. During this campaign, its standards of fairness, decency and impartiality have made it a household name to rank alongside Andrex. Mammy, we've run out. Never mind, here's a copy of the record. Do you want something to read as well? Eh, Martin? But no, all that is a lie, he said in case the record's lawyers are watching. Its journalism puts it alongside the finest in the country, provided the country in question is Romania. But at least the record isn't completely confused. Scotland on Sunday, described recently by a senior Labour source as a rag, has lashed back by advising its readers to vote Labour at all costs. That'll show them. Meanwhile, the Observer, which was straight Labour at the UK general election, now tells its leaders to split their votes to prevent an overall Labour majority. And the Sunday Post editorial doesn't mention the election at all, but it does rail against the evils of the Euroloo. But then, as this guy will tell you, there's one thing worse than not being talked about, and that's being talked about. King Sean is cross with the record too, not just because they rubbished his chum Alex's idea of a money penny for Scotland, but because they printed a picture of him allegedly cutting up rough after he'd seen the SNP's poll ratings. 
except it appears the photo may have actually been taken some time before. Oh dear. Still, we're looking forward to the follow-up. Under the headline, you'll have seen the circulation figures then. Ken MacDonald takes on the fourth estate. Now, whatever happens on Thursday night, one thing is certain, a monstrous regiment of women will be entering Scotland's Parliament in the Assembly Hall next week, right under John Knox's nose. 40% of MSPs are expected to be female, the ultimate test for positive discrimination. So can they handle it, or will Scottish women turn out to be as disappointing as Blair's babes? David Porter has been hearing from some of them. May 1979, and a little bit of history in the making. Margaret Thatcher becomes Britain's first woman Prime Minister. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. No! Her election marked a definite break with the past. Traditionally, politics has been regarded very much as a male-dominated bastion. Despite changing attitudes, as late as the 1960s, there were just five women representing Scottish seats at Westminster. Today, things aren't much better. But the signs are that everyone really, really does want the new Scottish Parliament to be different. Well, it certainly looks from the, the figures we have so far is that, that there's going to be a lot more women in there probably between 35 and 40 percent, which is a big leap forward because at the moment at Westminster we only have about 17 percent of women go from Scottish constituencies. Also the age profile is, is likely to be a bit younger as well, so that gives you a different flavour if you like. And the, so we'll have a, a body of new politicians that will more fairly reflect society in Scotland. One of those who hopes to be taking her place in Edinburgh is Margaret Smith, the Liberal Democrats' health spokeswoman. She's convinced having more women in the new parliament will improve the whole decision-making process. Well, I, I think that women come into politics sometimes from different fields, from a number of, of men, and I think women just generally have uh, a different view of life. They actually try to pull people together and get something done, much more than many men do. Men, I think, have a, a greater tendency to maybe want to empire build and show how wonderful they are on their own. The SNP believe their record reflects a history of bringing women into politics. Winnie Ewing famously won the Hamilton seat for them in 1967. The new generation of female activists insist the old Westminster ways will have to be abandoned if the new parliament is to succeed. I would hope we would see an end to the Yabu politics, that we won't have Westminster transported up to Holyrood, and that um, there, there are women there who are committed to making a difference to other women's lives in Scottish society. It's going to be better because the way the Parliament will work will be different. It will be more family friendly in terms of its hours of operation. It will have a whole new generation of people that are committed to making it work and to making a difference to ordinary people, to changing their lives, more jobs, better health service and better schools. And I think that's what people really want from the Parliament. Those women campaigning for Holyrood are already getting a taste of the likely workload they could face. Monday, Tuesday, not possible, doing a factory visit on Tuesday. While Labour tried to achieve gender balance through twinning in the selection procedures, other parties maintain women should only be chosen when they're the best candidates. I don't think it was fair on perhaps a very able man to have been beaten by perhaps a less than able woman, and I don't say that to to say anything against any of the women who have come through, but I don't think any woman should get there just because she's got ovaries. Much has been made of the fact that the new parliament offers a chance to reconstruct and rebuild politics in Scotland. At the parliament's permanent home in Holyrood, the foundations have yet to be laid for the new building. In fact, the demolition men have still to complete their work. And some see that as an appropriate metaphor. The campaign for racial equality has issued what it calls a millennium challenge to all the parties to better reflect Scotland's ethnic mix in the new political world. The system is currently failing black and minority ethnic communities. It's obvious from the people that are being put forward for election to the Scottish Parliament. Um, we are not getting a representative, representative mix. Uh, from all the different communities um, going forward to the Scottish Parliament. And our concern is that the Scottish Parliament will remain a white institution. So close to polling day, it would be impossible to think about selecting new candidates. But by the end of the week, we'll know who will occupy these benches. We don't yet know their names, 
but it's a fair bet that those sitting here when the Parliament meets for the first time later this month will better reflect Scotland as a whole. Of course, the final decision will be made by the most important group of all, the voters. David Porter on some of Scotland's women on their way to Holyrood and just don't dare call them Dewar's Dames. Time now for our weekly focus group. This week our eye in the back of the cab has been picking up views on that voting system. How many actual votes have you got? Uh, just the one, I believe. I don't know, how many votes can you ask two? Four, is it no? Four? Aye. How did you make that out? Labour. Three guess and three Labour. Club Dems. And the Tories. Two. no longer the first past the post system, it's the, uh, what do we call it again? Is it proportional representation? Proportional representation, that's the one. 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 Uh, one, two, one, two, three. Four. You think four? Aye. Uh, no, it's no four. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the first vote for? The first vote? Aye. It's for the Green Party. How many votes have you got? Two. Two? Possibly three. <laughs> Not another one. Two dinner. There you have it, a random sample of voter confusion in the streets of Glasgow and everyone was genuine. Now look at the morning's papers and the courier says, nationalists and labour step up war of words. The Herald leads on Tony Blair's visit to Kosovan refugees, ordering aid at the double. And there's the SNP, Scotland's voice, saying the best children are leaving because we didn't get a parliament 20 years ago. And joining me now are two people who didn't leave, Kenny McIntyre and Brian Taylor. Kenny, there seems to be a huge amount of confusion about uh, the second uh, vote. Uh, you know, surely some this should have been sorted out beforehand. Didn't we have an education campaign that was supposed to educate us about it? I think a lot of people, particularly senior Labour people, do believe that the Scottish office got it wrong, that they, along with government ministers, should have embarked on this information campaign a long time ago, and they wouldn't have been in what they regard as a dreadful situation. They are extremely perturbed this evening. I think a lot of people are deserting them in the second vote, and they think that this is actually going to strengthen Alex Salmon considerably. Tomorrow they're going to enlist the assistance of Alex Ferguson to Manchester United manager to say go for a hat trick this week the same as i'm going for go for three votes for labor first second and council all right well brian taylor i mean do you think that is likely that it is the snp who will benefit as it were from the confusion about how to use this voting system i'm not sure there's quite the confusion that people people feel uh, fear I, I i think despite the some of the individual concerns that you see there when people sit down and think of it when, when they look at it in, in, in the ballot papers it'll be presented re reasonably clearly to them explained to them indeed by returning officers who you don't think they just them away. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so I really don't think so I, th I think people will, will but there's evidence that the Scots in the past have been able to, to, to use tactical voting for example during the period when Scotland was apparently desperate to oust the Conservatives the tactical voting came through there to find the best method to achieve that particular outcome now I think the outcome that people are looking for this time they will find the method to achieve that and despite what the Labour Party is saying despite the other parties saying you know one 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 stick with us all the way I think that you're going to see a lot of ticket switching ticket splitting I think you're going to see voting across the parties like that because that perhaps is what people want the parties don't think of it that way the parties think that people are are loyalists they are Labour they are Tory they are SNP they're Liberal Democrat they're not you know that all parties are coalitions and people in their own minds are, are making up perhaps a, a different mix for the, the new Scottish politics well Kenny there's certainly a scrap uh, among the parties for that second vote, and we're going to hear a lot of that in the next couple of days. Now, how's that? How's it panning out? Because it appears as if the Liberal Democrats are slipping behind um, the Tory party in their bid for the second vote. Even privately, some senior Liberal Democrats will admit to that. I think that there is a bit of real worry creeping in there because it would be disastrous for, as far as they're concerned if they came forth. If they're to be in a strong bargain position, it's imperative that they come forth and squeeze the... the and the very briefly, the is there an SNP surge or is that an illusion, Brian? Not, not a surge, I, I wouldn't say, Ian, not a surge. I mean, that would be an inaccurate description of the, 
the situation, but they do have an opportunity to give themselves a real kick at this on Thursday. Brian Taylor, Kenny McIntyre, thanks very much. And that's all from Campaign 99 for another programme. We'll be back on the eve of poll on Wednesday here in BBC One Scotland at 10 o'clock. You'll be able to hear from all of Scotland's party leaders in the last programme before the polls open. That's Campaign 99 this Wednesday at 10 o'clock at BBC One Scotland. So for me, till then, good night. This is a very special election, and not just because it'll make Scottish history. Every voter will have two votes. Sounds complicated, and it is. That's why I'll be there. Democracy in Scotland has never been like this before. You can travel with me around our model of a new Scottish Parliament. This is a very serious election, but it'll be a whole lot of fun too. BBC Scotland, radio, television and online, covering Scotland's elections.